I want to place a focus on a piece of legislation um, today, the Police Act specifically. And to do that, I talked with Tom Engel, who we've had on the podcast before, and he's an Edmonton-based lawyer who works uh, as a criminal defense trial lawyer and is very involved in a lot of issues when it comes to police and policing reform. So Tom and I go through a few things when we talk about the Police Act um, and specifically the changes that we want to see and that he's pushing for in his work. So things like police investigating police, things like the loophole that allows police officers to retire without facing charges um, if they choose to leave their jobs. Um, The basic authority and the power that we give police, I think, is really key to understanding and I think reforming this legislation and seeing how those changes might impact the way that people not only interact but are policed and face consequences from um, bad policing. Um, so I feel like this is coming in a moment too where it's not necessarily getting all the attention that it can, um, because it's a static piece of legislation that, you know, has its changes and changes over time. But those changes, I think, are often influenced by, uh, the needs of police and the needs of politicians who are trying to get reelected, not necessarily the needs of people, um, every day who are interacting with police or have to be policed, um, in the real world. So, Yeah, Tom makes a lot of good points, and um, we're coming into a provincial election in 2023, so now's the time, really, to, um, I think, look into these things and see what's possible. So this might be a simple question, but why does the Police Act need to be reformed? And uh, for listeners who may not know, the last time it was, I guess, updated was in 2011, and it was introduced in 1988, but in 2022, why does it need to be reformed? Well, I'm not the only one who thinks that the Police Act has to be reformed. At the the consultative process that I participated in for the CTLA with that the government started in uh, the summer of 2018, the NDP government, the, the Minister of Justice at that time, Kathleen Ganley, started the review process. And I was invited from the very outset for the CTLA. And we were involved. In, in a very intensive review process, we, we had monthly meetings, for example. There are all kinds of stakeholders. All the stakeholders you can imagine who should have been there were there. And then it was very clear that every, all the stakeholders agreed on, on the need for drastic reform of the Police Act. And I think it was unanimous that it was agreed that the police should no longer investigate complaints. That, that is, that's the giant reform that was recommended. But then the uh, UCP got elected and I, they shelved the whole project until George Floyd. And then Minister Doug Schweitzer at the time quickly pulled it off the shelf and put it into action again. And then we were involved in an even more urgent, intensive process. And my understanding is that the final report, which I haven't seen, was scheduled to go to cabinet in December of last year. And then cabinet will make a decision. I don't know exactly what the recommendations are. I'd be shocked if it wasn't uh, to take to take investigating the police out of the hands of the police. But there were a lot of other, there were a lot of other recommendations. For example, big one would would be uh, police act jurisdiction over an officer being lost when the officer retires, which has let people off the hook. For example, Constable McLaughlin in Calgary who shot and killed Anthony Heffernan. He he escaped any any, uh, responsibility for that. The Alberta Crown Prosecution Service decided not to prosecute him for that, which in my view was a perverse decision, but we still had the police act process and then he beat that by, by retiring. So that, that is something like lawyers, for example, don't, don't beat law society discipline by retiring. You, you still 
have to go through the disciplinary process unless the law society allows you to retire. So that's 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 an example of an important one, and I don't, I'd be shocked if that wasn't a recommendation. And that one would really shock me if the Minister of uh, of Justice and Solicitor General didn't recommend to Cabinet that they agree with that one. So that's where it is. And now we're just waiting for the result. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the RCMP because the RCMP police is a big part of this province. And that, of course, wasn't under review uh, in in the, the Alberta Solicitor General's uh, review of the Police Act it has no application. But um, having said that, you know, it's kind of, I'm kind of torn a little bit on the idea of creating a, an Alberta police service. Because if they did, they'd be subject to the Police Act. Mm -hmm. And the Police Act already is much more um, robust in terms of civilian oversight of the police than the RCMP Act. And successive federal governments have failed to address that for the RCMP. For example, the civilian oversight uh, body, the uh, Civilian Review and Complaints Commission under the RCMP Act has no decision-making power. So all they can do is recommend things like if you lose your complaint, if the complaint is dismissed by the RCMP, you can ask the CRCC to review it. And they'll review it. It takes about three years or more. The delay is disgraceful. But, but the RCMP commissioner has the power to just disagree with the commission. And then nothing is done. So... We've been advocating at the federal level for the CRCC to be given the same powers as the Law Enforcement Review Board under the Police Act. The LARB has the power to, in some circumstances, fire an officer. Has that ever actually happened? Have officers ever been directly fired by the Law Enforcement Review Board? What's happened is uh, I, I don't think they have. I think all that's come to the LARB have been appeals by officers who've been fired at a disciplinary hearing at the level of the police service. But the, but the point is, they do have the power. Most of this show's focus, and I guess a lot of the public focus, at least in Edmonton, has been on our local um, Edmonton police force. Um, but there's been the larger conversation now provincially because of Casey Madu and the UCP about, you know, replacing the RCMP. Um, what do you think the current state of the RCMP is in Alberta when it comes to um, policing and accountability? And, you know, there has been a few pretty high profile um, cases of police brutality, um, specifically one against an Indigenous um, Indigenous chief. I remember that in Fort McMurray. But from your perspective, um, what, what, what have been the problems and what, have, what has been um, the situation with the RCMP in Alberta? Okay, so you, you talk about the folks being Edmonton, but don't forget the RCMP, Police Shirt Park, St. Albert, Leduc, Fort Saskatchewan. And uh, this is part of the, uh, I guess, the metro Edmonton area. Um, so, so the RCMP, their investigation of complaints is generally, it's disgraceful. And... I think they do it because they can get away with it. I think they do it that way because they can do it. And there's no accountability at the top. Now, the, the CRCC has been issuing some pretty aggressive criticisms of RCMP investigations recently. Um, but again, they don't have any power to order things. I've noticed that the CRCC has managed to to convince the commissioner of the RCMP to agree with them. And if they do that, then what they recommend will happen because the commissioner will make it happen. The difference is that for serious injury or death cases for the RCMP, they are subject to the police act under section 46.1, and they will be subject to an ACERT investigation. So that's different, that's different. But 
The vast majority of complaints against the RCMP are not serious injury or death. Mm. And that remains with the RCMP. And the RCMP, in their investigations, they don't even follow the RCMP Act. It's just brazenly don't follow it. And we pointed out to them, you're not following the act, and they just go ahead. It seems like a weird kind of situation to be in. And it seems like a lot of these situations come down to something that you mentioned a few years ago when we were talking um, like political will and how a lot of these things are kind of just left up to the provincial and federal politicians who sometimes either don't have the will to make it happen, choose to put things on the shelf, like you said, that were already worked on. Or just, yeah, completely ignore this thing like the RCMP. It, it, it kind of seems um, dangerous to leave all these things neglected to the point where um, it's like decades go pass and, and we see just no change on on what you said are, are pretty, pretty egregious um, disregard for the law, I guess. Maybe there'll be a little more political will at the level of the federal government and joined in by the RCMP commissioner if, for example, they think, well, you know, maybe we can tell the Alberta government, okay, look, we'll reform the whole accountability process. Does that help keep the RCMP in Alberta? I mean, if I was the commissioner, I'd be, I'd be behind that for sure. But the George Floyd situation certainly did help develop some political will nationally and provincially to reform the, uh, the police accountability process. And we shouldn't underestimate that. Of course, the other big player in this in terms of accountability is the Alberta Crown Prosecution Service, which in my view is being derelict in its duty to prosecute officers. Even when, even when a charge is laid, like there was a recent example of Kyle Parkhurst who got his head drilled into a wall while he's handcuffed and was lying on the ground. He gets picked up, gets his head drilled into a wall and it's captured on video. And a certain investigates recommends a criminal charge. The Crown Prosecution Service agrees to prosecute. And then a month later, without giving any reason, the Crown drops it. This, this inspires uh, disrespect for the administration of justice in this province when it comes to accountability for police officers. So I saw a couple of weeks ago, um, Michael Elliott made a tweet about um, someone in an organization that you're working with having um, defund the police or abolish the police in their, in their Twitter description. Um, and that being, you know, a point of contention. Um, so you've had your fair share of critics over the years. Um, some of them more, I'd say credible than others or with more credible claims. Um, so I guess from that situation or other situations, what are what what are your, what is your takeaway about those um, critics and and maybe are there any memorable or maybe even um, funny moments that you have from uh, those uh, kind of situations? You know, there was a period of time that I I had to fend off complaint again to the law society after complaint to the law society about me. I think I was up to about you know in the area of twenty five to thirty. And they are, they were from police service, the, the Edmonton police service, uh, you know, individual officers, but I'm sure that the union was behind, behind them. And they were, they were basically trying to, sh to shut me up, to intimidate me into stopping what I do. None of, none of that, none of those complaints were upheld. I had to deal with them and, um, and there were there was the case of the uh, a bunch of uh, EPS officers unlawfully accessing information about me from their police information systems, and obviously they were I'm sure they were trying to see if maybe I forgot to appear in traffic court and had a warrant and they'd have the pleasure of arresting me or something like that, or they could just find something that they could use. I know that. Uh, the Edmonton Police Service and the Edmonton Police Association is very upset about my Twitter account. Very upset. And, you know, uh, I get the impression that they're very upset that I sources of my information comes from within the police service. I know they I know they're very upset about that. And uh, I remember a letter from uh, the Edmonton Police Association that was published on 
on their Twitter account indicating that I and uh, those who provide me with information have lost their way or something like that. But you have to think of why, why would somebody within the EPS give me information? You know, why don't they just raise it with the chief? <laughs> well, it ain't going to go very well for them if they start start raising problems with the chief because it's going to get because the code of silence um, is strong within any police organization and it exists in the Edmonton Police Service and and if you if you make a complaint within the Edmonton Police Service you're likely to have a very short career as a police officer. So they're whistleblowers. That's what they are. They're whistleblowers. And a whistleblower can breach confidence. They're supposed to keep information co uh, uh, confidential that they gain while they're a police officer, unless, unless there's a clear public interest in exposing that publicly and they don't have any other way to effectively deal with it. So they're, they're, bitching and whining about me um, exposing information, um, it's misplaced. They should, be, they should be trying to figure out, well, why are members doing this? Obviously, they're not happy with what's going on. And they don't do anything about that. They're just, they, I'm sure they'd like to track down the, uh, the whistleblowers and then deal with them. So, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, and, and, you know, ACERT is so overloaded with 46.1 investigations, serious investigations, that they have to turn back some investigations to the EPS to investigate. They just can't handle them. They're already, they already have a backlog of about three years. So they've created within the professional standards branch a 46.1 unit. Who do they have working in that unit? A guy by the name of Dave Radmanovich. He didn't get caught wearing one of those shirts, but he was a member of the same squad. And that code of silence subculture was deeply infused in that squad. And then he got caught. He got invited to present at the Citizen Police Academy, put on by, I think, the... Uh, Edmonton Police Service and the Edmonton Police Commission. They invited Rad Banovich to speak to that. They had all sorts of citizens. They had police commissioners there. And he, he was talking about how in policing the inner city, he would, he would uh, have people ride the lightning. I think it had something to do with not having to get your hands dirty or something like that. But anyway, he was telling them that he would have them these, these the homeless people in that area ride the lightning, which is the taser. So now this guy is in the 46.1 unit. So I tweeted about it, and I guess they weren't happy about that. I view uh, Mike Elliott and Chief McPhee as being a team, and I think there's pretty strong evidence of that with McPhee promoting Elliott to staff sergeant while he's still in office and outside the regular promotion process. So I don't, um, Mike Elliott's uh, criticism of one of the policing committee members being a lawyer who advocates, who is a police abolitionist. <laughs> I, and, and, and what he did was, he said, he quoted me by saying, the interest of the policing committee is to have the best policing possible within Edmonton. He figures this is a contradiction. What she meant by that was hoping to get to the point where you don't need police. Okay, that's a pretty idealistic viewpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, if she's on our committee... That doesn't mean that the chair of the committee, me, has to agree with that. We have, 
we have very smart lawyers who are knowledgeable on the committee and they bring different viewpoints. And he seems to think that it, that I should have disallowed it as if, as if I have veto power about who's on a CTLA subcommittee. I would, even if I had the power, I, I would not have done it. She's a valued member of the, of the committee and, and that it was obvious she would be uh, when she joined the committee. So I, I just think that kind of criticism is like really reaching, really reaching for something to criticize me about it. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the podcast. It was really nice to speak with Tom again about a lot of these important issues. We'll be releasing more episodes along with uh, our different kind of segments, uh, including the Cringe Corner uh, coming soon. And uh, reach out to us on social media or through any other channel if you want to continue the discussion about these important issues um, or have any feedback or comments um, or just want to, yeah, just reach out and uh, stay in touch. And uh, we'll be back pretty soon in March with another episode. And uh, yeah, all the best. Take it easy.